Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Welcome back to Beyond Wellness Radio. We got Jim Keen in the house. Jim is a fellow Austin native, just moved down here last year from Chicago. He's part of the ARX scene. Again, I've seen Jim many times over at the Bulletproof Conference, over at Paleo. We got to connect here soon in Austin now that you're in town. But welcome to the show, Jim. How you doing? Thank you very much for having me. I feel superlative. They can't stop me now. Two cups of coffee deep and uh, living the dream here in Austin. That's it, man. Well, you're interesting because you work with kind of newer cutting edge technology with the ARX, which is cool. You've kind of gotten some of this diet and lifestyle stuff down. You've kind of intertwined the two, but you also have a, a personal story. I know you were up to 270, 280, and look at you now. You're you're all svelte, not to mention there's something to be said for that mustache too. It's, so, I'm actually the same weight. It's just the mustache is so <laughs> slimming. Yeah, you don't, I love you don't realize. It. It's an illusion. Yeah. An optical illusion. I love it, man. Very cool. <laughs> Walk us through your story. How did you get to where you're at? So I was a trumpet player my first career. I have a degree in trumpet performance of all things. And for six years, I worked on Broadway shows when they go on their first national tours. Um, I would play in the pit orchestras for those tours. But I was about 270, 280. In college, I got really good at drinking, uh, which was fun. But then I got super fat. So that was no fun. And then I had just three hours of work every day at night. So my hobby during the days became how do I get not fat? So that led me down the big rabbit hole with which we are all accustomed uh, to the primal and paleo side and also to the Lyle McDonald, Alan Aragon, count them up macro sort of side and yep, yep. it mixed together. And then I became aware of the prototypes of what would eventually become ARX. And uh, eventually it just became too much. Couldn't handle it. I said, I'm getting off the road. I took some tour money and I bought what was a previous generation of an, an ARX machine and I put it in my apartment in Chicago, a one bedroom apartment. Uh, and instead of a couch, I had this ARX Omni machine, uh, which was great bringing people over, nowhere to sit, but we had an Omni, so that was good. Um, but nice. anyhow, nice. Uh, one thing led to another, and then I've come now to to work for the company. Uh, great. So kind of walk me through kind of how the diet and lifestyle component became added, because I'm always fascinated how people kind of arrive at optimal health. And some people take different journeys. I mean, you had access to this really awesome cutting edge, and we'll talk more about it, kind of ISO kinetic technology that really kind of shortens your workouts and allows you to kind of get your best bang for your buck there. But how did you incorporate the diet and lifestyle component? What did that integration look like? Well, the diet and lifestyle stuff, I it was actually the reason, one of the big reasons for my career change uh, was when I became aware essentially of uh, circadian cycles and yeah. sleep. And that was my first big aha moment was like, I am messing up. I, the show ends at 1030 every night and I'm playing trumpet, bright blue lights and loud noises and like stress levels and your heart's beating because it's got to sound like the cast album. You got to sound good all the time. And so it's a high stress thing at 1030 at night and uh, that dog ain't going to hunt. So that actually learning about all this type of stuff spurred my inspiration to get off the road and, and do this. And then other than that, uh, just reading all the books we all know and love uh, and just learning the reasons behind like plants and animals and uh, good clean water and uh, no blue light after dark and all these, it all kind of come together. And then when I got off the road, I started actually putting it into practice because I didn't know if it worked or not. I had read about it but then you don't know who's blowing smoke and, and who's just selling things. And so uh, then I tried it on my own and uh, some things didn't work, but some things really worked. And then in each area thereafter, I just became really enamored with those things that gave you a great return on investment. So in food and in sleep and, uh, and in exercise, which is why I became aware of ARX and sort of joined that movement uh, was just like in this area, it gives you a great return on investment. So let's maximize that and really concentrate it. Love it. So kind of walk me through kind of where was your diet before? Was it kind of a standard American thing? And what were some of the first couple of shifts? Did you cut grains out? Did you just, you know, get more good proteins in, more vegetables versus other types of starch? What did that first diet shift look like? You mentioned the lifestyle shift, which is kind of the circadian rhythm. I know Dr. Jack Cruz, you're a big fan of, and we know the circadian rhythm stuff, if you're out of harmony with it, it can create insulin resistance, just like eating too much carbs or grains can. But sure. walk me through that diet transition you made first. Well, uh, it was actually me bumping my head against the wall about seven or eight times in a row, like Einstein's definition of insanity. And I was just the eat less sort of idea and I would count calories. And so we've all been there. Anybody who has a excess weight to get rid of has been there. So that's where I started and that didn't work long term. So the first thing, I think this was back in 2008, 2009. I'm not exactly sure when the book came out, but I, I read like Gary Tops and that was oh, my yes. first 
was like a good calories, bad calories. And I thought, calories, okay, calories, that's yeah. simple enough. I get that. I'm a smart guy. I can just sort of not eat carbs. And it wasn't really anything uh, about food quality that I was focusing on. It was, I was just like uh, the early days of carb counting, you know, like almost an Atkins style thing. Um, and so that was the first thing. And that was successful. And a lot of people have initial success with that. And then like a lot of people, your success sort of plateaus out. But to me, hanging out after that weight loss and plateauing, great success. Fantastic. Loving it. Uh, and so that was the first sort of thing. And that then leads down the rabbit hole. And there's lots of articles that are written about that and blog posts that are written about that. And, uh, and so I was absorbing all that information and then slowly took that same basis and then started adding in some things I was learning about food quality. Uh, so it was that book, uh, Jonathan Baylor, uh, yep. The Smarter Science the calorie delusion. and then, yeah. and then oh, the yeah. calorie, yeah. Uh, calorie myth later. Yeah. Um, that was great background information, a lot of research there. Uh, and then most recently, along that same line, is the Jason Fung type stuff I've been getting into about yeah, fasting, fasting and mm -hmm. um, the metabolic uh, scenario that's created in that context. So I really like that, and that all ties in well. Um, and then learning a lot of other stuff along the way. Great. So just curious, just um, on the clinical side here, just give me a quick diet recall. What was your diet like just from a breakfast, oh, yeah. lunch, and dinner perspective before? And then just kind of walk me, where is it right now? So before it was uh, sort of at my 270 days, it was sort of anything goes with an emphasis <laughs> on the seafood uh, diet, right? The yeah, seafood yeah. Diet. It, precisely right. And uh, so I had no problem with fast food and deep fried stuff. And, and I just crushed that. And my my torso was just this uh, well-equipped cauldron of stomach acid that uh, could handle pretty much anything. I was invincible. It was great. Uh, but I'd just get super fat instead. Uh, so <laughs> so that was cool. Love it. I had a lot of late night eating, especially when you go drinking. You got to have fourth meal and then sometimes fifth meal. Uh, so I just crushed that. I was real good at that. Uh, and so these days, uh, I do more of a, uh, like I mentioned before, a circadian approach of sort of a large breakfast, uh, protein and fat primarily. Um, and then uh, if I'm going to do a workout later that day, maybe a little bit of carbohydrate. Um, and then I have a meal right around 3 or 4 p.m. on a day when I'm in control of my schedule. Uh, 3 or 4 p.m., I'll fire up another sort of smaller meal. Um, and I, I'm sort of weird. I like to mix breakfast uh, for dinner. I don't mind having dinner that. foods at breakfast. I, I have no that. problem having a burger or pork chops at breakfast. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of weird that way. And I have no problem having, you know, six eggs and a bunch of veggies uh, in a bowl with, with some seasonings for dinner. Uh, and my girlfriend thinks it's weird and I regret nothing. I love when I do bacon and eggs for dinner. It just really mixes things up. It's just awesome. See, yeah, it makes the mustache thicker too. More power. <laughs> I love it. I like it. Breakfast foods are it. good for that. Yeah. Very good. So I'm just curious, like when it's all said and done, like, what do your macros look like? And, and you, you may not have run it through like a chronometer or a MyFitnessPal, but any idea kind of where they sit, protein, fat, and carbs? Sure. So I do kind of a, a cycling thing because my ARX workouts, I get yep. a whole week's worth of workout in uh, just a one day. So typically I'll do one day a week of a very intense ARX workout. And uh, so I usually have that be my carb day. So I'll work out fasted. And then uh, as far as macros, I might go 200 grams of carb, uh, 140 of protein and the balance in fats. Uh, I don't add extra to really hit uh, any macro goals these days. You don't like just like whole foods, like chicken thighs, like just real foods with real fat in it, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, on normal days, I typically keep carbs uh, by happenstance around 50 grams uh, or fewer. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just sort of mm -hmm. a steak and eggs, like an old timey bodybuilder. We just like kind of eat steak and eggs and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and chew on some nails and then that's it. Uh, and so some, sometimes I won't have any use for any sort of starches or fruits or, or anything like that. And I'll go for five or six days like that. And then it's time for the workout day. And I will uh, kind of skip breakfast and do the workout fasted, uh, tear up some muscle, empty out the remainder of the glycogen, and then carb up again that afternoon, being careful to leave four or five hours between the last bite and your head hitting the pillow. Yeah, because uh, I hate going to bed on a full stomach these days. Okay. Uh, I'd like to like to leave plenty of room there. And do you feel like you sleep better when you up your carbs like that? Or do you feel like it doesn't matter? You don't notice any difference with diet changes in sleep? I feel like uh, it doesn't make any difference so long as I leave plenty of time uh, in between dinner and bedtime. Uh, you'll you notice a heating up effect. You burn through those carbs and you might start sweating a little bit more than normal. Uh, those nights, I sometimes wake up at 2 a.m. having covered the sheets and sweat. Uh, just because my body's still revved up from that. 
Um, but normally, yeah, I, I sleep pretty well normally. I've, I've put a lot of uh, thought and time and energy and money invested into my sleep thing. Like uh, I've got a magnetic sleep pad and a nice mattress oh, and I have a nice. blackout shades and I keep my bedroom, uh, you know, pitch black and cool. And, and so away from uh, no electronics and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, so it, it would take a lot to, to have me sleep bad. That's great, man. Really cool. And then just curious. So you kind of got this diet stuff dialed in, anti-inflammatory, nutrient dense, low toxin kind of uh, paleo template. And then walk us through, how did you start incorporating the ARX? And then also just give people just the first, uh, just a cursory overview of what the ARX is. And then let's dive in deep to what's actually happening scientifically there. Yeah. So ARX stands for adaptive resistance exercise. And what ARX yeah. is, is a technology that we uh, invented, that we produce, and that we ship out and sell that uh, allows people to perform strength training, resistance training. So it's a tool for that purpose. And uh, I was, uh, still am, a big fan of high-intensity training, yep. which I heard about first from a guy named Ellington Darden. Uh, has a book, oh. uh, has a lot of books, but one of them I got a hold of. Uh, 2007 was my first introduction to that. Very quickly, I became aware of a guy named Arthur Jones. And if you mm -hmm. remember that name, he's the guy who invented the Nautilus yep. line of equipment and also founded Medics. Uh, and so I read everything he's ever written. Uh, that took a little while, but I had a lot of free time. I was out on the road, just living in hotels. So I had a lot of free time to read. Uh, and so I became aware of the idea of brief and intense and infrequent exercise. The modern uh, iteration of this is Body by Science the Doug McGuff and John Doug Little McGuff, book. Yep. Uh, and so some of your listeners might be aware of Doug McGuff and Body by Science, and it's sort of um, a revision of the high-intensity training principles. And uh, so that was what I was trying to do. That's the protocol. That's the goal. Uh, and then I was just looking around for what's the best tool for that purpose. And you could use a barbell to do it. You can use a dumbbell. You can use a selectorized weight stack machine. Uh, but I became aware in 2009 of these uh, what would eventually become ARX machines. And they're just another form of resistance, just like a weight is, but they're a better tool for the job. And so um, what it actually is, is a computer-controlled, motor-driven form of resistance. What it allows you to do is uh, it provides what we call adaptive resistance, but essentially it just means equal and opposite. However hard you push, that's the resistance you receive in return. So a weight is the same weight up and down. It's just using gravity. So if you lift 100 pounds, you have to lower 100 pounds. But the weird part is that that means you're underloaded for a lot of the time. And you might notice lowering a thing is easier than lifting that thing. Yes. And a lot of people say, well, it's because gravity is helping you, but that's not really the reason. The reason is you have a far greater potential for producing force in the eccentric, when your muscles are lengthening. And that happens when you lower a weight. So for instance, you can control the descent of a far heavier weight than you could have lifted in the first place. And a lot of the research these days cites 40% as the number. You can lower 40% heavier than you can lift. Now, if you're using a weight, I would agree, you can control a 40% heavier weight on the way down than you could have lifted in the first place. But there's a big difference between lowering a weight and resisting an irresistible force. So with an ARX machine, it's moving at a constant velocity. The motor is moving you. It's man versus machine, and you're fighting the motor, and you're intending to not move, and then it moves you, right? So it elicits a far greater response from your muscles. But then even on the pushing part, it resists you now. So first you're resisting it, then it's resisting you, and at all times, the resistance is perfectly matched to your strength. Now with a weight, Here's your strength, your fresh starting strength. You need to select a weight that's down here just so you can have multiple repetitions and have a set of exercise. So after the first rep, now your strength is here. You're a little fatigued. After the second rep, after the third rep, after the fourth rep, and you get all the way down until your strength is equal to the weight that you selected, but it took you like a minute or two to get there. So now that's the failure moment. That's where you can't move anymore, and that's where your set is done. But what if you could have a weight that matches your strength right away and then matches you each step on the way down. What if you had that failure intensity right from the very first rep and the whole way through? That's perfectly matched resistance. And it's because of that that it's uh, such a potent dose of the active ingredients in strength training, mechanical tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress. So you take those three things, you concentrate them, and you get a better bang for your buck.
I imagine it probably also decreases injuries as well because the weight's always within what you can handle your threshold versus your threshold drops 20%. Now the weight's 20% over. So I imagine you must see less injuries as well. Is that true? Pre precisely right. And the main two reasons, uh, like you just mentioned, the first thing is it can never be excessive. So we've all experienced being in the weight room and the weight that you selected is all of a sudden excessive. Maybe because you picked the wrong weight, but maybe because now you're fatigued. So that big heavy weight you chose for your fresh strength is now being applied to your fatigued musculature. So that's the first thing. ARX can never be excessive. It's only responding yeah, to you. That's but nice. the other thing is that nothing's going to fall on you. Gravity acts on the user 100% of the time through gravity. So as soon as you pick up a weight, you've just made a commitment to lower that weight no matter what happens. So if you feel something weird in your shoulder, your hip, your knee, well, good luck getting that thing back to the ground because it's trying to get to the right. center of the earth and you're in the way. Uh, but ARX can only act in response to the user. So uh, it's very safe for that reason. Nothing's going to fall on you. It can never act on you unless you first act on it. And if you stop pushing, the resistance drops to zero instantly. Well, the cool thing I like about it is that the feedback of the, the new screen um, feedback where you can see your power oh, yeah. output. And that's phenomenal because the cool thing about it is you can go back and you can look where you started the workout, where you ended it. You can see how you're progressing from previous workouts. And then isn't there like a threshold where when there's a drop from your maximum output, 20% or 30%, what's that threshold where, all right, you're done. You're, you've hit that maximal threshold to climb. What's that at? That's uh, what we call inroad mode. And there was yeah. an idea from Arthur Jones. That it, it means fatigue. Yeah. And you can program it to end after a certain number of reps, after a certain amount of time, or, and this is for people who want to be really targeted about what is the minimum effective dose, you want to induce a very specific amount of fatigue and no more. So what we uh, have is the inroad mode that establishes a green work zone, and you can set it for any percentage you like. Let's say you set it for 50%. And what that means is whatever your maximum is, and you're looking at a screen right in front of you, whatever your maximum is, there's a green zone that is then established based off of that maximum. Uh, that represents 50% down. Ah, and then each rep, you attempt to get up into the green zone. So as long as you get up into the green zone, you get to do another rep. Congrats. <laughs> you do another one, another one. When you encounter the repetition where you can no longer get up into that green work zone, I, as the trainer, I know I've taken 50% of your strength away from you. And your steak is done. We take you off the grill. You're that's done. It. And I press stop. And that's it. Because you're 50% fatigued. That's all I want. Next movement. Uh, and so that is like, well, why eight reps? What if I need 10 today? What if I only need six today? Or how come two minutes? What, what if I only, I mean, people are very dynamic. They're not static with their recovery ability. So you're having a bad day. It might be only four reps. And I've taken half of your strength. And you just don't have it today. Why do any more? Why beat a dead horse? So we can measure that, which is very cool. And the other thing you pointed out was uh, we have a couple of people on the team who are fans of Mario Kart from back in the day. And yep. so Ghost Car in Mario Kart is where you do a run and then you race yourself in the Ghost Car and how you did before. So we thought, what if you could do that in your workout instead of just lifting for sets and reps? What if I could see as I was doing the workout, what if I could visually see what I did a week ago or six months ago or a year ago and compete against that guy? That's really cool. So we have the ability now to do that where I can pull up any workout I've ever done, put that up on the board, and then fight against it in real time to see whether I'm improving or not. I love that. That's so cool. Now, you guys kind of started out with like a fixed type of device to start. It was like a kind of a straight push or a straight, you know, with the, with the arms mm -hmm. or with the legs or a pull, correct? But then now you've kind of moved your way to a cable. So it's a little bit more of an unstable environment. Can you talk about that transition and what's on the horizon? I know we interviewed Keith Norris last year around May or so. And, you know, Keith is part of one of the, one of the founders that's behind ARX. So anyone listening to this interview, take a look at Keith's interview last year, but can you talk more about that transition and where are you guys going next? So it started out with, and we still, the motor on this machine is still humming along from 2008. Uh, but it's imagine a forklift laid on its back. Yeah. And the thing just goes back and forth and you put a plate on it to put your feet and you put some handles on it. So with that, you can do a leg press and you can do a chest press and a row. A row. So upper body push and pull and legs. And that has developed over the years, the 10 years later, a bunch of R&D into what we call our alpha, the ARX alpha. And it's the main sort of, when you think ARX, you think about the alpha. It's the maximum in efficiency. It's uh, a whole body workout in three moves from the same chair 
Uh, it's for the masses. There's zero learning curve. It's kind of like uh, how people all drive automatics typically today. Yeah. And there's some people who drive manuals, and that's if you're an enthusiast, yep. yeah. if you're a car guy, or if you want to have that versatility and control. But most people, they just want everything done for them. Thanks. Yeah. Like, what's the easiest possible thing? We exactly. even train we even train people to drive using automatics now. So that's what the alpha is. It's uh, all your major skeletal muscles, all the medical benefits of strength training, uh, and off you go. Great, very quick workout. But then we, of course, uh, ourselves and through a lot of people who are athletes or enthusiasts, weekend warriors or people like that who wanted a little bit more novelty and wanted uh, a couple more bells and whistles and different angles of things. So then we created the Omni. That was the second uh, of the two machines that we offer. And the Omni is like the manual transmission. It's a little yeah. bit more versatility and control. And there's anything you can do from a cable pulley machine, you can do from the Omni, but it still has that motorized resistance that is the real uh, driving force behind the technology. So uh, a pull down with any attachment, angles of chest press, a belt squat, a deadlift, Romanian deadlift, compound row, biceps, triceps, shoulders, It's it's got all that type of stuff. Um, but again, for my parents and my grandparents, uh, it's just alpha all the way. It's just sit down, sit down, ma, push, pull. All right, go live your life. See you next week. And uh, and then week after week, ma gets stronger, provably uh, in the data. So those are sort of the difference between the two that we have now. Right. So one's more fixed, one's more of a cable type of environment. What's happening next? Is can you share what the next evolution is going to look like? Well, at this point. We're sort of the next evolution. Uh, is it more portable? I, I know you guys have a portable one that you give demos with, but is that where it's moving, where it's a little bit more portable? There's, uh, yeah, the demo unit is one thing. We're sort of innovating new ways to have a smaller footprint so we don't need mm -hmm. to build a big crate to ship one. Uh, and we could carry it in our cars to trade shows, and we can give it to people for that purpose for home use. So that's on the horizon. But really, uh, essentially, we're a technology company now because we're having all this data. We have uh, over 115 units out in the wild. So we're collecting all this data in the cloud and doing nothing with it right now. And so that's our next thing. How are we going to use just all of this data we're accumulating? Uh, we don't know. That's a big blank spot. We're also, uh, we have in beta version, a, a dashboard. People can see their data from home. Uh, obviously, we have to build an app for that same purpose, have all the API calls satellites linking in space, talking to each other, and, and you can start to integrate your ARX data with the rest of your um, you know, Internet of Things, quantified self data. Um, so that's sort of where our, head's at, uh, where our head's at now. And then integrating that into larger uh, corporations and employee wellness uh, initiatives or into assisted living communities around the country and having them compare notes and share data and what's the best way to help that population. And so um, there's a, a bunch of different uh, sort of avenues that way that we're also uh, focused on. Yeah, the cool thing I like about it is it's an objective workout. You can see your performance. You can you can see trends, and it's fast, and you're not going to hurt yourself. That's kind of the big benefit of it. And you're always pushing. You're always pushing, but you don't have to go to the rack and grab a bigger weight and throw it up and hope you can get it down like you said. It's this you're kind of being pushed in a zone where you're not going to hurt yourself. Yeah, and what you're describing is just one of the what I call barriers to entry. And for a health practitioner, it's sort of huge that everyone sort of knows we need to be strength training, but we're just not going to spend spend the time to go to the gym and three, four, five times a week, and we're going to look stupid, and we don't know what routine to do, and there's people grunting in there and loud noises, and so you know what? I'm going to retreat to my elliptical or retreat to my uh, treadmill or my bike, but we need to be strength training. If it were a pharmaceutical, it would be a billions of dollars per year industry. It's uh, for bone density and metabolic health and tendon and ligament oh, resilience totally. and longevity and on and on. It's this big scroll, like yeah. long list of benefits. And so for a practitioner to put even like just the alpha in a facility and, uh, and you, you read out that laundry list of benefits and then you say, I have a non-invasive outpatient procedure that I can now do takes about 10 minutes and you come in for it once per week and you can get all those benefits and completely avoid the bone and muscle loss associated with aging. What do you say? Like what sort of patient is going to say no to that? That's like, shut up and take my money. Yeah. Uh, and so in that way, it's providing strength training, real meaningful strength training to the masses who aren't going to do it. Otherwise democratizing strength training. It's for the masses. Now there's just a better, easier to use tool. Uh, for that purpose.
Love it. So let's say someone, so first off, how can someone get a hold of some of these devices? Who can they find who has them? And then let's say they're not quite there yet or they don't have something near them. What can people be doing at home outside of just conventional, you know, resistance training with compound movements or interval training? So I'll, I'll kind of give you that in two parts. Go ahead. Sure. So the first part, uh, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash ARXFIT uh, forward slash ARXFIT. Uh, you can just shoot us a message. Let us know where you are. And uh, we'll uh, connect you with whomever is closest. Uh, and that's probably the best way to figure out where one is near you. And uh, the other thing, the what to do if I don't have an ARX near me or I don't have the wherewithal to go use one, what do I do? Um, the first thing I would do is uh, go check out either the book, Body by Science. Uh, you mm -hmm. can get on audiobook or regular book, whatever your flavor. Um, read that book as just a primer. If you know nothing about strength training, or even if you have a little bit of a background, still read that book as a good primer on what mm -hmm. to do and why. So that's the first thing. That's great. And then um, whatever routine you end up doing based on what you learn in that book, I guess the important thing to realize is uh, a misconception that we fight with all the time is the idea that more is better. And people think that more is better because they imagine that the benefit, the good part, happens during the workout while they're burning the calories, while they're on the bike, while they're doing the thing, that's when the good stuff's happening. And that's just not true. The workout is the stimulus and the adaptation that we want, the muscle development, the bones, tendons, ligaments, all that, that happens while we're resting and recovering. So when you go to the gym, just realize the good stuff isn't happening in the gym. And so more is not better. And basically uh, for some more specifics, I would just recommend that each workout be a full body workout just for return on investment purposes. And while it is, you can do six days a week and do the bro split, Monday's chest and Tuesday's yeah. biceps and back and Wednesday, totally. you could do that. But uh, we're talking about return on time investment and less wear and tear on the joints. And I'd say two times per week, max. Uh, just go, like the workout should fit around your life, not the other way. So uh, a full body routine that prioritizes multi-joint movements, so compound multi-joint movements, uh, like a leg press or a belt squat or something similar for the lower body, uh, a horizontal push-pull and a vertical push-pull. That's a good basic starter routine. Those five sort of things constitute a full body workout. And uh, my basic recommendation would be trying to, again, find the minimum necessary dose, the minimum effective dose, uh, would be one set of each thing, and if you're using free weights and you're not being too hardcore about it, okay, do a second set of each thing. That's fine. Not going to kill anyone. Uh, just do a couple rounds of that. Select a weight that permits between 8 and 12 repetitions. If you get to 12, make a note to increase the weight for next time. And then slowly, you increase the weight, increase the weight, always keeping between that 8 and 12 repetition range. And that will produce an amount of weight that's not dangerous and hard to handle yeah. and is not, is not unmeaningful. Uh, either. So it's a good sort of happy place. And even that, that's like your 80-20. That'll get you a lot of Perfect. the benefits of strength training. And once you have more competence, and once you're convinced that it's safe, and you're into the groove of it after three or six months, then you can branch out and do as you like. But that's good to, to build a base if you don't have access to a, an ARX machine. And you like a longer contraction, so like a seven second kind of contraction. So you're really stimulating the lactic acid and the growth hormone. Is that correct? Yeah. That I, longer I'd contraction? Say, yeah. So long as you're eliminating momentum. You're totally. in control and, of the weight the whole time. And, and, there's and no if someone's used to using momentum at all, you don't need nearly as heavy of a weight because when you just take away all momentum, it's amazing how much harder that weight becomes to push. Right. Precisely right. So if the goal is to lift some weight, you're going to, yeah, the goal is external. I'm going to do whatever I can to use momentum and lift this weight. But you have to reverse your perspective. The goal is in your body. And we're just using the weights as a tool. I don't care how heavy the weight is. I care what's happening in the body. So to your point exactly, you can use far lower amounts of weight, which makes it safer, which is good because uh, weights are inherently dangerous. So yeah, less weight and really control it because uh, the goal is in here, not external. Right. So some kind of a, a push or pull, something in the, in the frontal plane here where you're pulling down straight, uh, a hip extension, a knee extension, uh, just s things like that that really hit all those different vectors there. Is that true? Yeah. The yeah. most consolidated routine you could do and have like kind of your 80-20 effect would just be like a leg press 
a chest press and a row. Even if you did those three things intensely and focused, um, I'd maybe call that, yeah, 70, 30. It's better than sitting at home. That's that's great for longevity and all the rest. You could add two more upper body movements to that uh, to make it a little more rounded out. And then if you wanted to expand that, then you could talk about some of the single joint things like leg extension or leg curl or um, typically it's young males, but <laughs> people who just, yeah, do some biceps, do some triceps. Bros, don't let bros skip biceps. So exactly, you know, you fire exactly. Up, just pol polish the guns every now and then and uh, get your life together like that. And, uh, but yeah, so, th so that's what I would recommend. Have, try to make each workout be um, worth your trip. Full body workout, focus, be intense, but safe. Awesome, Jim. Is there anything else you want the listeners to know that you think well, is important? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the, the ARX stuff, I've kind of explained what we're doing and why we're doing it. And uh, I'm, yeah. of course, all about that. I changed careers to be part of the ARX movement. So, yeah. so, I'm, so I'm into that. But as far as uh, a takeaway for your listeners, because I keep forgetting it myself, how important it is to prioritize sleep. Mm. And no matter how much you learn about it, seemingly, at least this is me, maybe I'm just slow. Uh, and no matter how much you learn about it, it tends to just eventually get neglected until you wake up one day and you're like, why am I eating 30 minutes before bed? And how come I'm going to bed at 1130 after watching some movie? And how come I'm, ah, I need to go to bed earlier. I need to get the electronics out of the room. I need to make it pitch black in here. I need to not go out so often or whatever you need to do. When you start sleeping really well, uh, everything is better. Your decision-making is better. Your thinking is better. So, and you grow better from your ARX workouts uh, and your growth, your sleep, that's where more is better. That's where the good stuff happens. Whatever wow. change you want in your body is produced while you're sleeping. So get the hell to bed is my, is my main advice. For Makes everybody. sense. And we get growth hormone tapping out between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So get in bed. The hours on the other side of midnight count for double. So keep that in the back of your mind. Maximize your hormones so you can grow outside of your workout. Love it, Jim. All right, man. Hey, appreciate it. ARXFit.com. Check out the Facebook page as well. And Jim, can people follow you anywhere? Uh, well, my personal, uh, Facebook page tends to get a little wild and woolly, so you can it follow does. me <laughs> as you know, so I you know. can follow me. Uh, I'm the guy who does the ARX posts for Facebook, but oh, yes. of course, family show language. And so, uh, you can follow me at ARX's Facebook page. That's probably the best way to get my takes on, uh, on the latest and greatest in the health and wellness and technology uh, field. I love when you manage it and you have people that have silly posts and you, you kind of comment on it and then you do a screenshot of it. Oh, that is just, I, I am not immune, uh, to messing with the trolls. Uh, I, I got to avoid boredom too. You know, I, I gotta, I gotta keep myself busy. So that's always a fun time. You should never feed the trolls. I love it, man. Very cool. Well, Jim, appreciate it. Jim Keen, um, phenomenal. We'll have the show notes up and everything below. Any last play to send the listeners at all? Um, just arcsfit.com. We have a bunch of videos and resources there. Check us out. Reach out uh, via personal message at the Facebook page. It'll be me answering that message. So if you uh, have any questions for me personally, just shoot arcsfit a message and I'll get it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, th that's, that's probably best. And I look forward to hearing from everybody. And if you want to troll Jim, you've been warned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show, Jim. Really appreciate it. You take care. Right on. Thanks, Justin. Bye.